name is Rebecca Jacobstein. I am the Director for Strategic Litigation at the Committee for Public Counsel Services, which is the public defenders organization in Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Daniel Marks. I'm an attorney at Fick and Marks, a litigation firm specializing in criminal defense and civil rights work in Boston, Massachusetts. And my name is Luke Ryan. I am also in private practice at a law firm in Northampton, Massachusetts called uh, Sasson, Turnbull, Ryan, and Hoos. Uh, like uh, Dan and Rebecca, I primarily practice uh, as a criminal defense attorney. So this, uh, this topic, this opportunity to talk about um, wrongful convictions in the context of relatively uh, minor um, case cases or crimes is, is really uh, something I've been looking forward to. I think when we think about wrongful convictions, we're all trained to think about these big cases, these murder cases where people have been in jail for decades and you have these committed lawyers who spend big chunks of their life trying to uh, unearth uh, evidence that the person is actually innocent. And as you know, important as those cases are, I think the vast majority of wrongful convictions happen at lower levels where the stakes aren't so high and the lawyering isn't so great, both on the prosecution and on the defense and where the police work is a little sloppy and where the, the volume of the system can kind of overwhelm people and put them in these positions where it almost becomes logical to cut their losses and admit uh, often doing things that they didn't do or be found guilty after trials where uh, their rights were not uh, protected in ways that we all hope they would be because, uh, you know, again, the stakes weren't anywhere near what they were in a murder case or a big arson case or anything like that. So I think that the this happens and we've all had firsthand experience of, of watching it happen in Massachusetts, but it, it, it's a piece of the wrongful conviction puzzle that I think is too often overlooked because it doesn't have these big high profile um, decades in prison kind of uh, exonerations. I don't know if you Dan and Rebecca would agree with that or not. I think that's right. I think one thing that's really interesting right now is one of the things we're doing is we are looking for people who over the past uh, decade or two had to plead guilty to um, a drug offense, a low level one, just to get out of jail or just to get out of the system. But the testing came back negative. So they knew that they did not have drugs on them. Um, but for whatever reason, they have a conviction on their record because they just couldn't keep going forward. And this generally implicates our clients, of course, are I, we do appointed work. So all of my clients are going to be poor um, and a good chunk of them are going to be um, black or brown. And it's, it's a system that is very much heavily weighed against those people because they are going to be held um, more often and for lengthier periods of time than their um, richer and whiter counterparts. And we're still trying to get this off the record because the collateral consequences of these convictions are just constant and, and never ending. So I, I guess picking up there, the, your, your comment about collateral consequences, uh, Rebecca, um, uh, made me think of one other common uh, misconception, so, uh, picking up where Luke uh, began. You know, in, in addition to the sort of the, the, the image, I'm thinking kind of like the, the Just Mercy movie, right? You know, to the image of, of the person on death row who spent decades in prison, uh, has a dogged lawyer like Brian Stevenson who spends, you know, a career uh, unearthing evidence to prove innocence and, and finally, uh, uh, you know, the, achieve some heroic victory. Um, you know, many of these lower level wrongful conviction cases, uh, you know, a common misconception is they're even about people who are in prison or jail anymore. And in many situations, by the time that someone has identified a problem with a case uh, and has an opportunity to do anything about it, uh, someone's finished a, a sentence of 12 months or 18 months or two years. Um, and really what the, uh, the fight is about at that point, the importance of wrongful conviction litigation at this point is 
helping people to get out from under collateral consequences. And, you know, for those who, who don't do this stuff on a daily basis, you know, that, that means really the devastating impacts across people's entire lives from their ability to stay in this country, depending on their immigration status, their ability to access public housing or benefits, their ability to get student loans, their ability to get a job. Um, I, I can't fairly attribute this because I can't remember which, which great book I read it in, but someone described uh, a felony conviction as a modern scarlet letter. Uh, and, and it's devastating. Uh, and even if you're out of prison uh, and, and served your time, um, you know, that's a weight that people carry. And if it was uh, unfairly uh, put upon them, you know, it's something I think all of us should be concerned about. I know the three of us certainly are. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the folks who, who really fall into this un unfortunate uh, twist in their life are often people who, who were really living on the margins and really living on the edge. Uh, there's a great lawyer at the ACLU named Jeff Robinson, who I heard one speak, who said, uh, you, you, can, you can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride. And that ride is that trip in the police cruiser. And, and it grabs a lot of our clients at times in their life where they just can't afford to be in jail, where um, you know, they're going to lose their job or they're going to lose their parental rights, they're going to uh, lose their housing. And, and in those moments when uh, their lives are disrupted by a wrongful arrest, that those collateral consequences that Dan were just talking about, that's really the furthest thing from their mind. Their immediate concern is, how do I get out of jail? And in so many jurisdictions, the way you get out of jail is you just come in and you confess. There are places where public defender systems are so overwhelmed that they're referred to meet them and plead them jurisdictions where public defenders come in, they meet their clients and they're marching them before a judge to um, uh, plead guilty where they haven't done any investigation, had had a chance to do any investigation and, and clients are willing to do this because they're told, well, you'll get probation, you'll get out of jail and you'll have a chance to get your job back, you'll have a chance to get your kids back. And the truth is, as Dan said, so often we have a system that punishes people after they've actually been punished. And so when you have a, a conviction on your record, that job is gonna disappear, that housing is gonna disappear, that student loan is gonna disappear, and sometimes your right to remain in the country is gonna disappear. So the, um, the, just the, the way in which we, we, we structure our, 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 our criminal legal system to um, to penalize people, often for very minor things, long after they've completed their sentence, is what makes the stakes actually very high in cases where, um, you know, you, they're not facing long prison terms. Rebecca, it might be interesting um, for the people who are going to hear this video to hear you talk a little bit in detail about the negative cert cases, because I think sometimes there is this assumption, why well, people don't plead guilty if they're innocent. Who, who would do that? Um, when in fact we know from experience in Massachusetts that there are cases where someone's arrested and charged with possession of drugs and when a chemist actually looks at that substance under a microscope they determine that it's not cocaine it's not heroin it's not drugs yet people have pled guilty anyways so maybe kind of describing those cases and how it's not that uncommon uh, maybe sort of eye-opening for people. Right so in in Massachusetts there is a delay between when they take the substance from you and when it gets to the laboratory and when you get the results back. And in that time period, before you know what the results are, um, you have court hearings. And sometimes at those court hearings, a lot of times at those court hearings, there is an offer on the table saying, this can go away if you admit to these being drugs or admit that we have enough information to prove you guilty, or you even have to plead guilty to having drugs. And your options are get out of jail today or have, you know, stop having to take days off of work and, or having to find childcare once every you know, four to six weeks and keep coming back to court to fight this, or you can just have it go away. And they will make you probably do about a year of probation, maybe two, um, they'll make you pay money, but at least you can keep that job. You can get out of jail. You can keep your kids. So it's, so you plead, you, you admit that this is a drug when it's not, 
And then the um, later on, the laboratory will send a, a certificate of analysis and that will say no drugs here. And, and as a result, but nothing happened. That doesn't go to the defense attorney and it doesn't go to you as the client. It just um, goes back to the prosecutor who may or may not even see it because that case is closed, right? They, they're not dealing with it anymore. So it just goes into a file somewhere and that's the end of it. Um, and if we hadn't received um, an entire database full of information, we wouldn't have ever even known this. Um, we received about almost 10 years worth of data from our drug databases. Um, and this is what we found and it, it's really horrifying. Yeah, so approximately five to 10 of all the substances that are taken off the street by law enforcement officers um, turn out to not be what the law enforcement officers think. They think everything they grab and charge people with drug crimes are in fact drugs. There's well-documented instances. You can have some fun uh, Googling about cases where people were arrested for possession of methamphetamine and it turned out to be cotton candy or kitty litter. Um, those kinds of mistakes happen uh, pretty frequently. And in a lot of cases, people will know, oh, this is actually cotton candy or this is kitty litter. But in other cases, you could have a situation where um, there's somebody who's walking down the street and uh, a person comes up to him and says, hey, do you know where I can uh, buy drugs? And just to get rid of the person, they'll direct them to an alley where they know that uh, drug trafficking is going on and it turns out the person who's making the request is a undercover cop and the person who pointed down the alley gets arrested once the undercover goes and purchases something. That person who gets arrested really doesn't know whether or not it's uh, baby powder or baby formula or cocaine and counts on these chemists at these laboratories to do this work. So um, again, they, they, they're just put in a position where right out of the gate, uh, they're in court having to make important decisions about um, whether or not they're gonna uh, try to you know, stay with the case and, and prove their innocence versus cutting their losses. And, and oftentimes people make in those moments what seem to be very logical choices to cut their losses when in fact they haven't actually committed a crime. Right. And, and that's one of the big problems from a legal perspective is, is the situations we're describing, which are very familiar and um, situations where people make logical, rational choices, uh, you know, in terrible circumstances, there's sort of that reality on the ground. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's sort of the Supreme Court's vision of the solemn ceremony of the guilty plea uh, and, and how it, it brings um, you know, with sincerity and accuracy and credibility, uh, finality to a criminal case. Uh, and, and it marks this sort of um, uh, critical moment uh, where the defendant has come forward and, and confessed. Um, when the reality is that that's not what happens, especially in these, these lower level, smaller cases where, you know, people are under the kinds of pressures you guys are describing or, or facing uh, long prison sentences where there, there's charge bargaining involved and plea bargaining and aggressive overcharging. Um, and so there's this sort of terrible gap between what the law thinks is happening when people plead guilty and the lived reality of people in those circumstances. And once you've done it, once you've pled guilty, as, as we all know, it, it's very hard to unwind that. Um, it's very hard to take that back, even if uh, it wasn't true what you said you did. And you were just saying that because it was a rational way to deal with a horrible situation you found yourself in. Yeah, I mean, what, what Dan just said about overcharging is something that can't really be stressed enough. A lot of times, put aside the, the chemical composition, there are, there are lots of cases that people will have where, um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the girlfriend of the drug dealer who has her house raided and they find narcotics. And the question is, did she know they were there? Was she, did she have any... Um, intent to exercise any control over them? And the answer to those questions may be no. But in those moments, that young woman may be facing this choice of, all right, do you want to trust a, a jury of strangers um, to um, 
basically decide your fate or do you wanna accept probation for a couple of years uh, where if you, you know, okay, I'm not gonna go to jail. You're, if, you, if you don't, there are what are called mandatory minimums where people are found um, guilty and a judge has no discretion as to what sentence to impose. A judge must, uh, in, in some cases, uh, give somebody a five-year prison sentence. So Rebecca or Dan or I might have these great arguments as to why if a person is found guilty, the court should be merciful and should um, recognize they have no record, that they were really um, under duress because of a, of a co-defendant who was pressuring them. But we can't make those arguments, or at least those arguments aren't going to move the needle because the judge's hands are, hands are tied. The judge is going to say, look, I, I, I hear you, but the legislature has said that if a person is found guilty of this crime, I have to impose a sentence of no less than five years. So again, a defendant in that moment who's thinking about things like, who's gonna take care of my kids, will often make the decision to plead guilty to something they didn't do because the danger of things going bad is so great. And it really is, it's a logical decision, but it produces an incredibly unfair and unjust result. And, and I just add, there's, there's a, a really sort of absurd aspect of theater to this whole thing, uh, where the, the reason why uh, the judge's hands are tied later, uh, as Luke just described, is because the law generally says, um, if a guilty plea was, <coughs> excuse me, if a guilty plea was knowing and voluntary, then it's legitimate and you're stuck with it. Um, and so uh, um, under the rules that apply in federal court and in Massachusetts courts and in almost every state court, a judge will go through uh, a very sort of ritualized scripted conversation with the defendant to confirm uh, that the plea is knowing and voluntary, that the person knows what it is they're pleading guilty to, understands the consequences, um, and that no one's pressuring them or forcing them or promising any, anything uh, to them to do that. But of course, if you step back, the person who's made the rational decision to plead guilty to something that they didn't actually do knows that they have to go through this dance with the judge, knows they have to answer the question, yes, I understand what I'm doing. Yes, I'm doing this voluntarily. Yes, I'm doing it because I'm guilty, not because I don't wanna lose my child or not because I don't wanna lose my job or because I wanna go home from jail today. They know they have to say those things. They have a conversation with their lawyer where their lawyer might explain. If you say to the judge, I'm only doing this because I'm being threatened, the judge will say, well, then I'm sorry, I can't accept your plea. And so this, the, there's this absurd exercise where the system is set up to elicit answers from people that it then throws back at them after the fact to say, sorry, when you came to court, you swore to tell the truth and you said you were doing this voluntarily, even though it's clear to everyone at the time, they have to say that uh, in order to um, make the rational decision or follow through with the rational decision that, that they're making at the time. So it's, it's really, um, <laughs> it's a terrible knot that tied people in. Dan and Luke and, and Rebecca, you've talked about the context of drug cases, but this is something that extends much beyond just drug cases too, doesn't it? It really does. I think that when he was, when uh, Dan was talking about this, what it made me think of was all of the innocence cases where there are false confessions. And it's interesting because that's basically what a plea is. A plea is a false confession, confession, confession in the, in a court of law. And, you know, it, the, the pressure that people are under is, is so strong that they, they, they will cede almost every time to make sure that they can get home or keep their job or keep their house or keep their children, you know, just keep their lives together. And, you know, I, I don't think it's really any different than the false confessions that um, the innocence programs find and document either, but it's, it, it's just as harmful. It is, and, and if you think of something like a, an assault and battery case, um, where say for example, a young black man is accused of um, beating up uh, a, a white man. And the truth of the matter is, is that the, the young black man was defending himself from a racist attack. 
that young man, black man, when he's faced with that choice of going to trial, in, particularly in jurisdictions where there just aren't that many people of color, in his mind is thinking, okay, I get to go tell my story to mostly white jurors who I know from my lived experience are scared of me, who don't trust me, and, and I have to rely on them to believe me, or I'm going to be found guilty and I'm going to go to jail for a long time. The safer, more logical way out of that jam is to just suck it up and say, yep, I, I did it. I was the one who was the first aggressor and take the two year suspended sentence rather than run the risk of um, experiencing uh, just part of this, the life of a, of a young person of color where the stakes really just couldn't be more, more high. So it, it is by no means at all limited to, to drug cases. This is endemic. This is a part of the criminal legal system that puts people in these awful positions day in, day out in all kinds of cases across the country. It's clear the frustration you all are feeling um, and you work with the system on a day-to-day -day basis. If you were given the opportunity to make changes in that system, what could we do? What could you do to, to make it better, to make it so that we didn't wind up with so many people who are actually innocent pleading guilty? We need better, stronger discovery rules. Um, what discovery is, is what the police and the prosecutors and the drug labs have to give you um, as evidence in your case. And for whatever reason, they get to decide what to give the defense attorney and the client. They should just have to give us everything, but they don't. And therefore they can either purposefully or inadvertently hold something that makes or breaks the case and really proves what we're saying, right? You know, we have a, a big, I think, a, a big um, area in which there are guilty pleas where my, my clients are definitely not guilty is when they are charged with um, generally disorderly conduct, resisting arrest and assault and battery on a police officer. And we don't get oftentimes um, the complaints against the police officers, those are withheld from us. Sometimes we don't get 911 calls or where somebody says there's a police officer outside beating this guy up. Um, you know, and if we were to able to receive quickly um, the information that the government has, this that would be really tremendously helpful. And I think that it would make, make a difference in some of these cases. But Brady requires that information to be given, doesn't it? And, 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 and does that mean that, that these are inadvertent mistakes or that there are intentional instances where uh, information is being withheld? Dan's smiling, so I'm gonna let you. <laughs> Luke, you wanna take that one? I think you have some experience with this. Yeah, the, the answer is both. Uh, both. When you talk about uh, Brady, that's a, a, a Brady v. Maryland was a 1963 United States Supreme Court case, which basically said that we have this adversarial system and the prosecutors uh, who represent the people or the government uh, in these uh, adversarial cases against criminal defendants have to turn over to criminal defendants um, material that would make it harder for them to get the outcome that they want. So it's a decision which we all like, but it, it, it's really at odds with human nature. You're, you're in this competitive game that you're telling one side, you've got to basically help the other side beat you. And human beings, I think, day in, day out, don't like that. They, 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 they feel like they're they're doing important work, they're protecting public safety. And so they don't wanna play by that rule because um, it could lead to results they don't like. And the thing that makes it so dangerous is when they don't play by that rule, almost nobody ever knows. It's, it's like self-reporting. And it, it is something that it's the rare case where it comes to light that they haven't played by that rule. So that's the intentional ones where a prosecutor says, you know what, I really think this guy's guilty. I don't want to give this 911 call over. 
the witness makes it seem like he's innocent. So I'm gonna pretend that I don't have this piece of evidence. And often a defense attorney and a defendant are none the wiser. There are also many, many cases where you have a overworked, overwhelmed prosecutor with 300 files on their um, desk and they just don't know what's helpful to the defendants in these individual cases because they, don't, they haven't had the bandwidth to look and see and understand, oh, this is what the defendant's defense might be. Um, it's a misidentification case. So this witness statement about seeing somebody who was six inches taller and of a different race fleeing the scene, that actually is important and they might want to use that. Those things don't get turned over and it's not because the prosecutor is trying to win, it's because they just don't understand the context of the case, how important that, uh, that evidence is. Yeah, I guess I'd add as an answer to sort of both of your questions, Mark, uh, both about Brady and about sort of a, a wish list from a, a criminal defense perspective, um, is uh, the system really needs uh, to do a much better job at holding uh, both prosecutors and law enforcement generally accountable for misbehavior. And that, that includes Brady violations. Um, it also includes just lying in court uh, lying in documents that get filed with court, in search warrant applications, in police reports, uh, exaggerating, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, things about a, a case. Um, it's very, very, very rare that anyone's ever caught doing that, and even when they're caught, that they're held accountable. I mean, I think just what we've been through in the past few weeks, sort of the national reckoning around. The, the murder trial, uh, George Floyd's murder and Derek Chauvin and you know, what it's taken for this country to, to finally hold someone responsible for killing uh, someone in the street uh, during an arrest. Um, if, if it's that hard to hold someone accountable in that situation, we're, we're light years away from holding people responsible for the everyday injustices of withholding Brady material or falsely testifying against someone about whether uh, someone was resisting arrest or whether someone struck a cop uh, during an arrest. Um, when prosecutors engage in misconduct, they're almost never named in opinions, even when it leads to the reversal of convictions. Uh, there's no discipline for them or for police officers who are found to have testified falsely. Uh, only now, I think the, the criminal defense bar is, is getting smarter and more organized around even collecting databases of this information so we can help ourselves uh, track some of this stuff. But um, the, uh, th there's, there's very little work done in the system uh, to hold people accountable for that kind of misconduct. Um, and, and it's a huge problem. From a process point of view, I, I've heard it suggested that one problem we have is that there are just too many cases and that if we tried to take every case to trial, the system would collapse. And therefore there's a, an incentive just on, by the system itself to move cases through, which tends to push toward plea bargaining. How, how do you reconcile that, on the one hand, problem of, of overwhelming the court system with, on the other hand, protecting the rights of the individual who may be getting railroaded because the system is just moving along too quickly? I don't think it's hard to make better choices about which cases we really need to prosecute. If we don't have a system in place that can provide fair outcomes for everybody, then we can't put everybody in the system. So what we need to do is, is we need to have better ways of fixing the problems that a lot of these laws are designed to um, fix. I, I can say that um, there's a study out of Harvard did a, a study of the Massachusetts court system. And one thing that they noticed was that for um, drunk driving cases, we have a lot of ways for people to get help for, um, for alcoholism or other or substance uses that um, can make it so that you don't have to go to jail and you don't have to have anything on your record. Whereas the, basically the same issue if the drug is not um, alcohol, though marijuana ha is, is, not, is not criminalized here anymore, but the rest of them, the response, instead of a public health response, which is what it is for, for drinking, the public health response is 
male people. And what the Harvard folks noted was that about 80% of the people charged with driving in Massachusetts are white. And that is definitely not the percentage of people charged with um, possession of narcotics in Massachusetts. So it, it's how you decide how you're going to treat what is essentially a public health problem is oftentimes dependent on the people you want to help and the people you want to jail. Yeah, it, it's remarkable to, to look back at what uh, often gets referred to as our noble experiment with the prohibition of alcohol and in the early 20th century. And, and what, a, what a disaster that was on so many levels in terms of increasing violent crime, enriching bootleggers, creating this product uh, when there, it's the iron law of prohibition. Anytime you're gonna outlaw a substance, um, the substance is gonna get more potent and more deadly. It happened with alcohol. People stopped drinking beer and wine and they started drinking hard liquor and, and this bathtub gin. The exact same thing has happened over the last 50 years with respect to narcotics. We are, um, the prohibition of drugs creates a huge problem for the system in terms of the amount of cases it brings in, um, and it provides no corresponding benefits. It's been, we've spent trillions of dollars to come to a place where drugs are cheaper, more potent, and more available than they've ever been. And, and so if you're looking for ways to shrink the system where more, um, where as Rebecca said, you could have a, a uh, fair outcomes for the people who enter into it. That's one easy way to, to cut down on, on the, the volume that overwhelms uh, all of us every day from everybody who's involved in the system just gets overwhelmed by the numbers of people who are, are brought uh, into, the, into these courthouses. You go to places like in Western Massachusetts where I practice uh, Springfield District Court and you just watch every day pre-pandemic, the people go through the, the metal detectors and it's impossible just not to think you're watching a war on the poor, you're watching a war on people of color. Um, and and it, it's unsustainable. If, if your goal is, is, is justice, you, you just can't, uh, unless you were gonna increase the, uh, the, the, the amount of money you're gonna put into this system tenfold, you, you're just not gonna have the resources to handle these uh, volume of cases with anything approaching uh, rudimentary fairness. Our audience for this program is the public. And um, with that in mind, what, what message would you give to them? And you know, people who are concerned about this problem and, and want to help improve the justice system, what can someone do to, to, to help make things better? I, I think that one thing you realize if you spend enough time in our courts is that if you didn't have to spend time in our courts, there would be more justice. Um, and I, I, I really think that if you can help people where they're at before they get there and look at people like they're really people because that's, that's who I represent. I represent human beings with people who love them and maybe they've done something wrong and maybe they haven't. But the reality is, is that the way this system treats them doesn't help anyone. No one feels like they got justice in the end. And to get, to get true justice, you really need to make, to make it a place where everyone has, has a chance and has a shot. And, and that's, I, I think, what I have taken from my almost 20 years in the criminal defense world. Look, it's a it's a big question. It's a hard one to answer. Um, um, I, um, you know, I think one one problem that we've had as um, as a society over you know uh, the past um, forty to fifty years. So I'm thinking roughly back to the late '60s, early '70s, the beginning of the drug war, uh, the the rise of mass incarceration, um, is that um, issues in the criminal justice system have largely been, for political reasons, uh, a one-way ratchet. Um, there's, there's more things that are being criminalized all the time. Uh, sentences are getting longer. The system is getting harsher. 
Uh, and there's a lot of vested interest in keeping it that way and maintaining those trends. Um, and at least it's perceived to be a, a big political liability for anyone uh, uh, in, in public office to say, well, hold on a second. This doesn't make sense. Um, uh, you know, this is not fair to people. This isn't justice. This is, uh, um, you know, this isn't sound public policy. Um, that, that may be true or that may not be, but I think one thing that would be very um, helpful and inspiring and wonderful to see in a younger generation is, is um, the sort of groundswell uh, of enthusiasm you see for other causes or people really sort of coming out and saying, this is something we care about, that we wanna change our national direction on, that will support public officials and political leaders uh, who take a totally different approach uh, to these problems. Um, who don't believe that you know, locking people up for life is the solution to social problems um, and, and that there can be a, a sort of a movement to sort of unwind some of these mistakes that I think our generation has made. I mean, sometimes I look, I'm the parent of teenagers uh, and sometimes I, I think, or I hope that uh, my kids will grow up to look back on the criminal justice system now, the one that I practice in and think about it the way I look back on the Jim Crow system, and it's almost unimaginable that anyone ever thought that that was a legitimate way to run a society, that, that, that in a generation we'll be able to look back and say, who would have ever thought the United States should lead the world in incarceration, that we should have millions of people behind bars, that we should be creating a permanent underclass, stripping people of civil liberties by tagging them with felony convictions. Um, in what world they want, I, I hope that, that the generation of high school students, maybe people watching this will grow up and they'll look back at us and say, you people were crazy. You know, this was no way to run a justice system uh, because it can be totally different. Uh, it just, it, it requires the political will to get there. Yeah, I mean, the degree to which we've normalized putting a human being in a cage is, is so sad and is, um, something that I think we just all have to reckon with. What Dan just said is true. We are the preeminent jailers in the world. And it is so far from our own conception of ourselves as the land of the free. We, uh, on a per capita basis, uh, are worse than China, we're worse than Russia, we're worse than Saudi Arabia. You name and think of these repressive places where people have no rights there aren't as many people in their, those prisons. And um, I think that the more we can make that not normal and, and, and refuse to buy into the idea that, um, that that's okay, uh, that the status quo is, is tolerable, the, the better chance we have. I think it also helps for, for us to think about our own lives and, and the, there's a, a, a a civil libertarian uh, in our part of the world uh, who wrote a book called Three Felonies a Day, um, which you know makes a pretty compelling case that we have so many laws that we're all breaking them all the time, whether we know them or not. And so this idea that jail is just reserved for those other bad people, it's really the place that the unlucky people go. We are all um, potentially subject to that treatment. And the more we can look to just reduce the size of this system in all of our lives, I think the better chance the people, as Rebecca said, who enter into it will have to get something approaching a just outcome. It's impressive the, the depth with which you've given this, these issues thought. I, I will say this, uh, um, because this is, is, is such a hard, um, uh, a hard vocation that, that we've chosen and that for people who are thinking of kind of um, making a life for themselves, working in, in an unjust system, um, it, the more you can find people like Rebecca and Dan to associate with, like that sustains me. I, I think being around other passionate, smart lawyers and being given the chance to look at their example and not just learn from them and their, their victories, but to be able to find good people trying to right wrongs and it, it is a big deal. And it's, it's a really hard thing to, to do uh, on your own. And so the, I would recommend anybody uh, who's, who's embarking on a life of uh, 
uh, attempting to bring some social justice in the world to recognize the value in, in, in forging relationships with, with like-minded folks, uh, because it, it really is the sort of thing that can allow for you to do this uh, and, and not burn out. Anything you want to add, Rebecca? No, Luke is the nicest person in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, go, work, go work for Luke. Um, <laughs> yeah. one, other, one other thing I'd say is we've talked a lot over the past uh, close to an hour about wrongful convictions in the sense of convictions of people who are innocent. Um, and, and that's a hugely important subset of people who are wrongfully convicted. But um, there's a lot of people who are wrongfully convicted who in an everyday sense, in a colloquial sense, are, are guilty, uh, factually, what we call factually guilty, not legally guilty. So maybe they really did do what they're accused of. Uh, Luke had the statistics of, you know, uh, five to 10 percent of drug samples that are, are collected in Massachusetts come back as not drugs. Well, that means 90 to 95 percent are. You know, there are a lot of people who commit crimes. Um, but many of those people get wrongfully convicted in the sense that they're not treated fairly. Um, that the system doesn't follow the rules, uh, that the constitution isn't abided by. And those are um, different, but as serious problems as people who are innocent being convicted. And um, sometimes that's hard for people to understand. You know, how can you represent someone who's done something wrong, who's guilty of committing a crime? And you know, often I use, uh, um, particularly with non-lawyers, the following analogies. Number one, as I say, you never ask that question about a doctor. Uh, you know, someone comes into an emergency room uh, they might be an ax murderer, but if they're having a heart attack, the doctor in the emergency room is going to try to save them and work with the nurses and work with the staff and do everything they can. And then once they're out of the woods, then, then let the chips fall where they're going to. But, but there's a, a, a service that needs to be provided. There's a need in that moment. Um, and it's, it's someone's job uh, to do that. Um, and in some sense, that's our role in, in, the, in the criminal legal system. The other analogy I often use, and again, because I'm a parent of teenagers, is I say, look, you, you get in trouble all the time. You get in fights with your siblings. You get in fights with friends at a school. And the issue comes before your parents or comes before a, a principal or something. Uh, and even if you're sort of in the wrong, you know, even if you hit your sibling first, uh, or even if you cheated on the test, don't you want someone there to help you and support you and to explain how you got in that situation? or to argue why you shouldn't be punished uh, particularly harshly. Uh, don't you want someone to advocate for you and to help work you through that process um, and, and try to help you come out okay on the other side? And, and that's really what I see our job is doing uh, in making sure that people aren't wrongfully convicted in the sense of being treated unfairly or unjustly, even if they've made a bad decision or a bad choice uh, or found themselves in an unfortunate situation. You have given us, uh, Rebecca, Dan, Luke, a great deal of food for thought. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to share your insights with our audience and, and thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you.